So let's talk briefly about how ranitidine works. So H2 receptor antagonist. So an antagonist is a drug that binds to a receptor but doesn't stimulate it and stops the natural agonist from being able to bind to that receptor. So the H2 receptor is a type of histamine receptor. Now, histamine is a very famous um, chemical mediator. It's most famous as being the thing that is blocked by antihistamine drugs. So histamine is used all over the body for different things. Now in the skin, if histamine is produced, it binds to a receptor called the histamine 1 receptor, the H1 receptor that is on the surface of nerves that innervate the skin. And when that's stimulated on those nerves, it creates the sensation of itchiness. So it sends signals up to the brain and that creates that sensation of itchiness in that region of the skin and makes you want to scratch it. So in the skin, histamine stimulates H1 receptors and causes itchiness. Drugs that bind to the H1 receptor and block them, so antagonists, and then stop the histamine from binding to the H1 receptor and stimulating those nerve cells will then block that itch sensation. Those are the drugs that we refer to as antihistamines. So Antihistamines are H1 antagonists, not H2 antagonists. Even though you can see how you might want to call these antihistamines because they are blocking a histamine receptor, it's customary only to call the H1 antagonist the antihistamines. The anti-itch medicines are the antihistamines. So antihistamines, think anti-itch, think H1 antagonist, things like cetirizine, loratadine, fexofenadine, diphenhydramine, promethazine, all of those drugs. Now, histamine is also used in the stomach and it, in the stomach, does something completely different. It binds to histamine 2 receptors, a completely different receptor that is on the surface of stomach cells and it stimulates those stomach cells to produce acid. If you therefore create a drug that binds to that receptor and blocks it and blocks the histamine from stimulating it, then you will stop that stimulation to produce stomach acid and you will reduce the production of stomach acid by the stomach cells. This is what H2 receptor antagonists do. Ranitidine is an example of an H2 receptor antagonist and that is how it works. So you would not call ranitidine an antihistamine, you would call it an H2 receptor antagonist. There are other examples of H2 receptor antagonists, however, I have never prescribed any of them. The only one I have ever prescribed is ranitidine. However, I do know the name of another one. So the other one that's named, the name of which I know is simetidine, uh, if you want to add that to your knowledge. However, as I say, I've never prescribed it. I've never seen anyone on simetidine. I've never seen it used in the UK. Ranitidine is the only one I've ever seen people. And previously, it used to be a very commonly prescribed drug. It used to be available over the counter. You could buy it in supermarkets. So let's now talk about what has happened to ranitidine. So this has happened in 2020, actually. The two great things that have happened, or the two horrific things that have happened in medicine in 2020, one is the COVID-19 pandemic. And the other is the ranitidine crisis. So in early 2020, it was found that a huge amount of the ranitidine that was currently available and had been produced in the world was, you know, sat in boxes waiting for purchase or waiting to be dispensed, was contaminated uh, with a carcinogen. So, you know, when they make this chemical, ranitidine, they have to do a huge number of chemical reactions, the chemists in their laboratories, and there are waste products to those chemical reactions, and most of them will be removed by processes that the chemists do. Uh, however, it was found that one of the waste products from the production of the ranitidine was still present within the drug tablets, and that this waste product was not harmless. It was, in fact, a known carcinogen. So it was found that the ranitidine all over the world was contaminated with this carcinogen. Therefore, it was withdrawn worldwide. All of this drug was taken back to the factories, withdrawn off the shelves, and people were told not to take this drug. And at the moment, it's still extremely limited, the supply of ranitidine. We have very little ranitidine available. It's not on the supermarket shelves. The factories, I think, are still working on trying to make a you know, find a new way of 
producing the ranitidine so that you don't end up with this contaminant. And once they do, the drugs should become back available. But at the moment, there's very little supplies that are available that aren't contaminated with this carcinogen. So very few people are able to take ranitidine at the moment. We only prescribe it in exceptional circumstances. However, let's presume that one day it will become available again and we will go back to prescribing it uh, regularly to people. So let me tell you now about the dosing uh, and the situations where we prescribe it. So it is available in tablet form and you can get both 150 milligram tablets and 300 milligram tablets. And these are the different doses that you could prescribe it in. So you can prescribe someone just one 150 milligram tablet once daily. If that's not enough to control their, um, their epigastric pain, uh, then you can up that to 150 milligrams twice daily. Another dose that is often used is 300 milligram once daily. So just one 300 milligram tablet once a day. Often it's actually prescribed at night. So when people are on these OD regimens, often they take it just before bed because especially if people are suffering from reflux where it's pain in the lower esophagus from stomach acid, when you lie flat, you're going to get more contents going back up from the stomach into the lower portion of the esophagus than when you're sat upright because of gravity. Um, so reflux symptoms can get worse when people lie down. So especially if someone's on it for reflux pain, we often prescribe these stomach acid reducing uh, agents at bedtime. And then the final largest dose that you generally see ranitidine prescribed at is 300 milligram twice daily, once in the morning and once at night. Before the worldwide withdrawal, the tablets that I used to see on display in UK supermarkets were 150 milligram tablets rather than the 300 milligram tablets. So only the small ones were available to buy rather than the larger ones. You'd have had to have a prescription to get these larger ones. Let's now just talk about the uh, situations where you'd prescribe ranitidine as opposed to a PPI. So normally, if someone gets epigastric pain, they might just treat it with over-the-counter medicines if they know how. They might recognise what the problem is for themselves and then they might go and buy Gaviscon or Rennies off the supermarket and if they manage to control their symptoms with that, that's great. If they don't, they then might buy for themselves some ranitidine over-the-counter and try that. If that doesn't work, they might change to the over-the-counter PPI that's available, which is Ezomeprazole, Nexium. They could even if they wanted to take both the uh, ranitidine and the Nexium together if one alone isn't controlling their pain. The problem is at that stage people usually end up going and seeing their GP. One, because the medicine boxes tell you to if you're taking this uh, a lot that you should see your GP about it. Um, and two, because these medicines are actually really expensive, especially over-the-counter Nexium. Over-the-counter Ranitidine is quite cheap, but over-the-counter Ezomeprazole is really, really pricey. You know, you can pay a good £10 for seven tablets, so £10 for a week's supply of it if you're taking one a day. If you're taking more than one a day, then, you know, it will last you only a few days. So let's say this individual has now come to their GP and wants treatment for their epigastric pain, usually... The first line treatment that the GP would go to is not ranitidine. They won't prescribe ranitidine. Instead, they would prescribe a PPI, usually a meprazole or lanzoprazole to that individual. When then do they use ranitidine? So one situation where they use ranitidine is if they can't give the person a PPI. So PPIs have side effects. They can cause electrolyte derangements. They can disturb the commensals that live within the colon and lead to very dangerous infections potentially in the colon, such as C. diff colitis. For more information on this, please do watch my video on the meprazole. I go into these side effects in detail there. In addition, they can cause problems with renal function. They can reduce the ability of the kidneys to get rid of waste products and lead to waste products building up in the, in the blood. So if any of these side effects happen with PPIs, then the individual might have to come off the PPI. And I would say of all those side effects, the most common one is electrolyte derangements, low sodium in particular. So let's say the individual's been on a meprazole for a year, and then the GP does some blood tests on the individual because they want to monitor them, because they know about these electrolyte derangements that can happen with the meprazole, and they want to make sure that this hasn't happened for this person. And they find that, oh dear, 
this person's sodium is low, they will then want to stop the omeprazole and the thing that they will change them to is ranitidine, the H2 receptor antagonist, at least, or at least this would have been the thing they would have done before the worldwide withdrawal. And once the supply is back, uh, they will go back, I think, to doing this. So this is what we used to do. Um, so that was one situation where we'd use H2 receptor antagonists if the PPIs are causing potentially dangerous side effects in an individual. The other situation where you use it is as an adjunctive treatment to a PPI. So let's say someone has really, really intractable problems with stomach acid uh, and they're on already very high dose PPI. So let's say they're taking 20 milligrams of omeprazole twice daily and they're still getting problems with epigastric pain then what you might do is add on ranitidine alongside the PPI. So they can be used together, H2 receptor antagonists and PPIs. So this individual might then be put on 300 milligrams OD of omeprazole, sorry, of ranitidine alongside their BD omeprazole. And if that doesn't work, the ranitidine could be increased to its maximum dose as well. So those are the sort of ways that we used to use ranitidine. One is an alternative to PPIs if the PPI has caused a side effect or the individual doesn't get along with the PPI. And then also as an adjunctive treatment if the PPI alone isn't controlling their symptoms. So the final question is, does this drug have any side effects? Is this a safe drug to prescribe? Well, of course, currently it's contaminated with a carcinogen, which means that it's not safe. However, let's presume it comes back clean and uncontaminated and we're prescribing it once again, then it will be, again, a safe drug to prescribe. And it's, in fact, its great merit is that it really is extremely well tolerated. Most people won't get any side effects from this drug. In fact, I can't think of a single case where I've had a patient uh, complain of side effects from taking this. The one little downside to it is that it's usually not as effective as PPIs. PPIs are usually more powerful at relieving the symptoms from the stomach acid. However, it is moderately effective. And as I say, PPIs can have big side effects, whereas this drug doesn't have those side effects. As I say, I've never seen anyone get problems with this drug. So it is, or it will be, once it comes back uncontaminated, it will be a safe drug for people to prescribe again.